All right, marriage prep 101, getting ready for the big day. This is lesson number 13, and the title of this lesson, Great Sex for Life. Well, I, I've told you that the main task in marriage is not raising children, it's not paying off the mortgage or uh, setting up a retirement plan. Those are not the main goals of marriage. I said that the main task in a successful marriage is maintaining the intimacy that caused you to get married in the first place. Now, if you don't have intimacy or closeness in your marriage, it doesn't matter what you do have, the marriage will not be a happy one or a satisfying one. One way to cultivate intimacy is to build closeness at the intellectual level, at the emotional level, and especially at the spiritual level. And we talked about that last week. Another important way to create intimacy is through satisfying sexual relationships. Of course, like everything else, satisfying sexual intimacy is learned and it must be maintained in order to, in order to grow. Now, just because you, you, you like or you need sex doesn't mean that you know how to produce intimacy through satisfying sexual intercourse. Many couples have to learn or relearn this because uh, there's so much misinformation in the world about, about sex. And so in order to separate the truth from the fiction, I'd like to briefly review with you the history of sex from Adam until today in six minutes. I think we can you know, summarize it. We'll give it a shot anyways, six minutes. Seriously though, if we had to list some major false ideas about human sexuality throughout history, it might look something like this. Uh, in the Garden of Eden, they, they had it right. Sex between Adam and Eve, two sinless people, is perfect and satisfying. After this, the lies begin. And so after the fall of man, the idea is that sex is complicated. Sex becomes complicated and misunderstood, manipulative. For example, Jacob's two wives who struggled to win their husband's affection and children. In the fourth century, sex is sin. Uh, Augustine begins to teach that Adam's sin is passed on from generation to another in a physical way. Uh, this gives rise to the idea that the manner in which one generation creates the next generation, and that's through sex, the manner must be bad or sinful because the result is sinful people. And so the conclusion was that there must be something wrong with sex because this was the way sinful natures are passed on from one generation to the next. In the 17th century, sex is dirty. By the Middle Ages, this idea had so taken hold that many women wore black, never referred to sex, and were considered simply as objects of uh, procreation. Uh, this attitude created the impression in people's minds that sex was dirty, that sex was not really a good thing, and it was to be tolerated within marriage. Of course, people eventually revolted against this oppressive and false view, uh, but as is often the case, they went completely to the other extreme, and that takes us to the 20th century. The 20th century, the modern ideas of sex uh, begin to uh, develop. In the late 18th and 19th century, puritanical ideas about sex were brought to North America, but by the 20th century, there, these were dramatically changed. For example, from 1900 to 1960, well, sex is fun. Two world wars changed this attitude. American music and movies, magazines, showed sex as something that was to be fun. Uh, people had to loosen up, rock and roll, playboy, let's, you know, let's have fun. In 1970, sex is free. The hippie generation promoted sexual freedom, make love, not war. Sexual revolution said, have sex with whoever you want, whenever you want, in whatever way that you want. By the time we got to 1980, sex becomes serious. The boomers grew up and sex became a serious matter, only for the mature sex advice columns and sex therapists and studies about human sexuality abounded. In the 1990s, sex should be safe. AIDS made people realize that some kinds of sex could lead to serious illness and, and death. And then from the year 2000 to this day, sex is really just for yourself. 
Sex is for the individual's pleasure and satisfaction. Pornography, especially internet pornography, homosexuality fed the person's desire for private sex. Of course, all of these false ideas about sex uh, have an element of truth to them. Uh, this is why, uh, this is what rather, it makes it uh, so believable and powerful. For example, sex is complicated, that's, that's true, but, but not so complicated that with proper communication and attitude, two people cannot have satisfying sex for a lifetime. Um, sex is sinful, well that's true in some cases, when uh, it's participated in outside of a marriage relationship, but sex is acceptable and blessed by God within marriage, Hebrews chapter 13, verse four. Um, sex is dirty, well, true, when used as pornography or the abuse of, of others, especially children, but clean, pure, and beautiful when shared between a married uh, couple. Uh, sex is fun. Well, true, but again, only fun and joyful when people who are married engaged in it. Otherwise, it's only fun for the people involved, but not for God, and certainly not the angels who witness it. Another idea, sex is free. Well, again, true, but only free to those who are in an exclusive lifetime relationship of marriage. Otherwise, there's a price to pay, right? In Galatians 5, 19, 20, it tells us that fornicators you know, will not inherit, adulterers, fornicators, homosexual, you know, illicit sexual practices. These people will not inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, sex is serious. Again, very true, but serious not in itself. Serious in the sense that it is the physical sign that two people are committed to an exclusive lifetime relationship. Sex is safe, true, but the safest sex is sex according to God's plan, not human concepts and trends concerning sex. And then finally, sex is for self. Again, true. Sex is for the full revelation of the self to our partner without guilt, without fear, and without shame. Of course, there are many variations of these ideas, but these are the major concepts that people view their own sexuality through. I don't know if we did it in six minutes, but anyways, it gives you a kind of a, a lay of the land of some of the you know, misinformation that's been out there for a long time concerning human sexuality. Now, there's another point of view on sex that I'd like to share with you, one that more effectively contributes to good sex for life. You see, the same activity that has the power to bond and to build and to create, to comfort within marriage, is equally powerful to create negative things if done outside of marriage. It creates guilt and shame, unwanted pregnancies, diseases, and so on and so forth. Psychological surveys show that in some couples who have sex before marriage, after marriage, the woman becomes more aggressive and dominant. She feels angry and resentful while the man becomes more passive and uh, with a sense of guilt. The way out, of course, is to seek forgiveness from God and each other and then just go on. The idea of seeing if people are sexually compatible before marriage so they can be sure, is, is, uh, you know, can be sure of having a successful relationship, this is foolish because engaging in premarital sex without the security of a marriage commitment undermines the development of the couple's relationship before it matures. Sex outside of marriage is a sin. It's a sin because it spoils the sex that we should be having within marriage. When I heard one guy say the trouble with sex uh, outside of marriage is that it spoils the sex that's supposed to go on within marriage. Now I want to talk about God's idea of sex. So we talk about some misinformation uh, and ideas that have been out there and that many of us grew up with. Uh, I'd like to talk about God's idea of sex. The, the, the real issue in sex is not making love. The real issue in sex is feeling loved and becoming one with your spouse. You can get sex in a lot of ways and in great quantities, but to feel loved through sex requires us to understand why God created sex and how God would have us express our natural human sexuality. So I'd like to devote the rest of my time 
to this idea. So what does God think about sex? Well, first of all, he thinks his idea is that sex is good. Genesis chapter one, verses 27 and 31, you know, it says God saw everything, he saw this and it was good, he created that, it was good. And then in verse 27, then 31, he says, he looks at everything and he says, all was very good. And that included human sexuality. So God's idea is that sex is good. Throughout the Bible, God extols the naturalness and the beauty of human sexuality. In Genesis 2, 24 and five, uh, we see sex without guilt or shame. Sin should cause guilt, not sex, between a husband and wife. Uh, Hebrews uh, 13 verse four talks about the, the uh, marriage bed being undefiled because God will punish the uh, evildoers, uh, punish adulterers. And in the Song of Solomon, chapter seven, one to nine, we read that sex is beautiful and exciting and passionate. We, we talked about that last week as we looked at some passages in the Song of Solomon. And then in Proverbs 5, this one I want to read, that Solomon writes, let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. As a loving hind and a graceful doe, let her breasts satisfy you at all times. Be exhilarated always with her love. This is the Holy Spirit speaking. Have you ever thought of this? You know, Solomon is writing by the power and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit here. And what is God saying? Sex is beautiful. What's he saying to men? Let your wife thrill you and satisfy you all the days of your life. So good sex is God's idea, not man's idea. Satan has perverted sex into a sinful thing, but in its natural state, it's a good and wonderful thing according to God. Another idea that God has about sex Sex is for marriage only. He says, you shall not commit adultery. Very you know, plain and simple, Exodus 20, verse 14. God designed the activity of sex to be practiced constructively within the context of marriage. I don't have to elaborate this to this group here. You know, God created sex and sex is good and wonderful and exciting and thrilling, but it's within marriage. When it's outside of marriage, it's, it's destructive. We have a commandment, we have all kinds of examples. I don't think we need to belabor the point here. Uh, certainly not in this class. What else does God think about sex? Well, sex is unselfish affection. First Corinthians chapter seven, verse two and three, Paul says, but because of immoralities, meaning the temptation to be sexually impure because of these kinds of immorality, Paul says, each man is to have his own wife and each woman is to have her own husband. So he, Paul recognizes human beings, you know, males and females are sexually tempted. They're sexual uh, beings. It's part of their natural nature, the desire to be gratified sexually. And when they're single, they can't do that in a satisfying and God pleasing way. So what does he say? Uh, each man, each woman should have a partner, should have a husband, should have a wife. And then he says, the husband must fulfill his duty to his wife and likewise also the wife to, his, uh, to her husband. So in here we, we get an answer, what is sex? Well, the point and purpose of sex within marriage is to please the other person, not self. When we have succeeded in doing this, we have succeeded and have probably had good sex too. When we please the other, we will be satisfied. That's how sex works. For men, this means a shift of attention from immediate need to consummate sexual desire and focus on the needs of the wife to become aroused. You know, what men want is I want what I want right now. And the change is, the focus change should be, I'm here to make sure that the needs of my wife are met. And if her needs are met, my needs will automatically be met. And for the woman, this means a conscious effort to get into the quote zone. In other words, to think about sex, to become sexualized so that she can truly respond to her husband's desire for her. You see, men want women to want sex. They want women to get into it without it being a chore or a favor. And women want men to want them 
and not just what they can get from them. You see the, the difference? And so they need to realize that this is, we need to realize that this is difficult for both men and women. These changes of focus, these changes of ideas, it requires effort. And it doesn't come naturally for men, for example, to wait, to want her, to want to please her. Because what's natural for a man is to want release. That's what's natural for a man. There's a buildup, they want release. And it isn't natural for a woman to zone in on sex because they are not visually stimulated. They're not motivated by release, but rather by the need for intimacy and tenderness. Dr. Randy Eichhorn of OU Health Science Center, one of the professors there, psychologist says, women view intimacy as a road to sex. Men view sex as a road to intimacy. The trick is to understand uh, and work with the differences and not accuse each other of not caring. You know, he says, uh, oh, well, you don't love me. You're not interested in sex. And she says, you don't love me. All you're interested in is sex. <laughs> so everybody's talking about sex, but they're not communicating properly. So what is required is a sacrifice by both people, both partners, in order to kind of catch on fire. Let me give you a little illustration of how that works here with a, with a match. You see, you have a, you have a match, you know, a match. And a, so when you light a match, recognize that both parts of you know, the lighting the match have to make a sacrifice. The match must sacrifice some of its smooth surface. Uh, against the roughness of the sandpaper. And the sandpaper must sacrifice some of the rough surface every time a match is struck against it. Otherwise, nothing happens. But if you, you know, if the match gives up its smooth surface, and if the uh, sandpaper gives up some of its rough surface, both together will create the flame. Well, you know, sex works like that. Each partner has to give something up. The man has to be ready to wait so the woman can get into the zone, if you wish. And the woman has to focus in on pleasing her husband and not just finding a convenient time. Another thing that God thinks about concerning sex, sex is uninterrupted. We read 1 Corinthians 7, 5, stop depriving one another except by agreement for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So sex is meant to provide pleasure all of married life. I mean, sex is for life, just like love is for life and intimacy is for life. Paul says that sex should be inter interrupted only by mutual consent or for reasons needing prayer. I mean, this could include disputes or illness or unavoidable separation. When this happens, we should pray to remain faithful and not to look for another partner. And it should be temporary. Sex is not a bargaining tool or a weapon. Some people use sex you know, as a bargain. You, if you do this, you get sex. Boy, that does not build intimacy. That does not build love, gratitude admiration. Or you, know, you use sex as a, as a, a, a threat thing. If, if, if you act in this way, I'll withhold sex from you. you know, this is not the way that God, you know, God did not design sex to be used as a, as, a, as a tool to threaten someone. You think of Abraham and Sarah, they had sex into their late years. God blessed them with a good sex life into old age. How do you think they conceived so late in life? You know, barring uh, illness and incapacity, our intimate life should last and be developed all of our lives. Now, there are reasons why this doesn't happen. Uh, the saddest reason is ignorance, ignorance about sex or just poor communication. 
Also, lack of imagination. You know, partners are unwilling to be creative or experiment or discuss or search for ways to please the other. Or we get into habits. We get into routines, right? TV, work, sports, hobbies that leave no time to develop intimacy or desire, which take time. These things take time. If you make the effort, it's worth it. It requires faith because you have to work your way into the feeling. Don't just have sex when you feel like it. You have to work your way into the feeling. If you, if you had sex only when you felt like it, believe me, you wouldn't have sex very often because there's so many things going on. We get, we, we get busy with so many other things. And of course, sin, nothing kills sexual desire like sinfulness, lying, laziness, vulgarity, meanness, cheating, impurity, all of these things kill the sex drive. The guys, you know, the guys think if they stay up late and watch porn online or something, do you think somehow this makes you more attractive you know, for your partner? You think, you think your, your wife is more you know, attracted to you because you've just been watching porn for an hour? You know. And girls, do you think you're attractive uh, and desirable uh, for your husband if all you talk about is just your kids or the house or chores or things like that and not talk about yourself or talk about him? You know, God created marriage to last a lifetime. And so sex within marriage should also last a lifetime as well. Happy couples report that their sex life grows more intense and satisfying as they grow older. Now I don't mean older like I'm 95 years old, I'm 98 and I'm having the best sex of my life. You know, I'm not saying that. I mean as, as we mature, as we grow into middle life and, 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 and early, uh, you know, early 50s and 60s and so on and so forth, uh, couples report that they have a more deep and meaningful uh, intimate experiences um, at that age. And why not? You've gotten to know each other over a lifetime. Of course, as your intimacy grows, as your security with one another grows, as your communication grows, we'll talk about that in a second, so does the quality of your sexual intimacy. All right. Communication is the key. Sex therapists tell us that the, the biggest problem that couples have with sex is not mechanics. We kind of all know what to do. Um, it's not mechanics. It's not even frequency or looks. The biggest problem with sex is communication. The main sex organ, of course, is the brain. That's the part of the body that controls feeling and desire, enjoyment and pleasure. If the brain is not stimulated or sexualized, then the other body parts cannot function properly. The best way to stimulate the brain is to communicate. And the best way to improve sexuality in a marriage is to learn how to communicate more effectively about sex. You see, the, the way to have good sex for life is to continue to communicate about it for life, not debate it, not argue about it, but communicate about it. One major problem in many marriages is that there are things we wished our partners knew about us or knew about sex, but because of shame or guilt or fear or embarrassment or anger or ignorance, we can't communicate with them about it. We think that they're going to guess and they don't guess and we remain unfulfilled sexually and we remain uh, miserable. So I'm going to finish this session and this series uh, by saying out loud some of the things that couples find hard to say for various reasons. Now I don't do this to offend or embarrass anyone but rather to open up lines of communications between couples who find it difficult to communicate about sex. They can talk about anything else except sex. So as you listen, write down and save those things with your, you know, share rather, write down and share those things with your partner that you may have found difficult to say in the past. Something that I may have mentioned here during this lesson. So here we go. Some things I wish you knew about me or some things I wish I could say to you about sex. Tell me how to please you. 
Tell me how to please you. Guide me so I will know what to do in the future when we make love. Each person has a different sexual character. It takes time to discover what that is for yourself and for your partner. It's very difficult if you don't explain. Now, there's no need to explain why something is pleasing or exciting, just that it is. You don't have to psychoanalyze yourself. I like when you do this. You don't have to say why, but you have to say, you have to communicate, you have to let your partner know if they haven't figured it out already. Another thing to say of the seven, I want to make love just for fun. I mean, sometimes a brief sexual encounter without too much foreplay or romance is okay. You know, we mustn't take sex too seriously. Sex should be fun and play at times. It's okay. You know, it's three in the afternoon, you're home early, the kids are a half hour away from being home and all of a sudden, you know, you kiss mama and mama kisses you back and wow, right there in the kitchen, right there in the living room, you know, 20 minutes before the kids get home. Are you guys crazy? You nuts? It's fun. It's good. You laugh. You're embarrassed with each other. Oh my, look at us. That's okay. That's fun. That's marvelous. That's, that's happiness in marriage. Another thing to say, seeing your body excites me. Don't hide it from me. Your partner's naked body is the only body you have a right to see. Don't deprive each other of that right and privilege. Ladies, don't let the movies or the internet take over your privilege so that the only nakedness your husband sees is in a magazine or a movie and not even his own wife. And men, the more you remain exclusively focused on your wife, the more she will be willing to share herself with you. And contrarily, the more your eyes wander, the less valuable you make her out to be. Remember that. Number four, don't force me to do what I cannot do yet. You know, everyone develops sexually at a different rate. You need to be patient with each other. It's okay to experiment. It's good to be creative, but agree to do so what both people agree to do. Otherwise it's selfishness and it can be abusive. Number five, I wish you would initiate sex for a change. I wish you would initiate sex for a change. When you do, it makes me feel desirable. I mean, nothing kills the ego like always having to be the one to initiate sex or affection. Sometimes men would be less demanding of sex if they had more affection. And sometimes women would be more willing to have sex if men demonstrated more affection that is unrelated to sex. In other words, if she felt you putting your arms around her and you know, kissing her on the neck wasn't a prelude to sex, but simply was saying, I love you. Number six, be kinder to me. When you are unkind, it makes it harder for me to desire you. As I've said before, nothing kills intimacy, romance and sexual activity than someone who is unkind. Someone who's sarcastic, you know, bringing you down all the time. Someone who's dishonest or abusive. Someone who is self-centered or cheap or critical. Desire cannot grow in this kind of uh, environment. And then number seven, try to understand what stimulates me. Try to understand what stimulates me. All right, I'm going to talk to I'm going to talk about women, so I want men, you know, I want you men to pay attention, okay? So women, all right, men, listen, this is some facts about women. There's a biological fact here that you need to know. A woman's sexual desire is linked to her cycle, her menstrual cycle. I know that sounds very old fashioned, but that's just, you know, plain old biology. It's linked to that, okay? That's a biological fact. Now let me give you an emotional fact. Emotional stimulation is necessary before there can be physical stimulation. You see what I'm saying? The best sex happens when the wife's emotional needs are taken care of on a daily basis. 
You can't buy sex at the last minute with flowers and candy. You need to take time to allow passion to rise, uh, to express love and affection before and during and after for continuous and enjoyable sex life to, uh, to be maintained. You can't be really nice and loving before sex and then after sex, boom, nothing. Zero, oh, I got to get up, oh, the game is on, I got to go, you know, this is, <laughs> this is not the way to develop uh, intimacy. Women, fellas, men, women are different. You have to understand, women are not just men in women's bodies. They really are different creatures than, than, than us, all right? All right, now uh, uh, I'm going to talk about men. All right, so I want the girls to listen up. I want to give an, a biological fact, all right? So uh, girls, listen to this. Um, the accumulation of seminal fluid within men acts as an ongoing internal stimulation. Okay, they're continually stimulated sexually because they continually are producing seminal fluid within themselves. And this acts as, you know, uh, constant desire for gratification. It's not because men are sex fiends, and that's all they think about, it's because God created their sexuality in that particular way. So that's just biology, right? Uh, now, an emotional fact. Men are visually stimulated. Wives need to take advantage of this. Don't let other people you know, do it for you. That's an emotional thing. You know, if you were to describe, if, you, if I was to make a diagram here you know, on, the, on, the, on the board, and I was to describe uh, women's sexuality and men's sexuality in a diagram, this is what it would be. If it was a woman, the diagram would be this. This would be a woman's sexual life, okay? A man's sexual life would be this. That would be a man's sexual life, okay? The problem is, how do you match those two different type of sexual emotions? How can you bring those together into a satisfying experience for both people? Well, the key is to find a balance between his needs and your ability to meet his needs and vice versa. God is wise in that he has created men and women in such a way that there has to be mutual compromise in order to have mutual satisfaction. Don't get mad because men are not like you, girls. And guys, don't get mad because girls are not like you. You always think, I wish women were like me. You know? I, would, I wish they had the same pattern as me. You know, tru truly, you don't want that. The thing that makes them exciting and desirable is that they're different than you are, and vice versa again. The thing that makes men exciting uh, and desirable is that they're different than you are. And that difference is on purpose. And God has forced us to you know, work with the differences in order to reach uh, satisfaction. So I've only given you seven things that you might say to each other just to get the dialogue going. The important thing is that you talk to each other about your sexual selves, not for the purpose of having sex. If you're talking about sex and especially you guys, oh, we're going to talk about sex. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, you know, maneuver my way into, no. Uh, the conversation about sex is about the two of you as a couple, okay? So you're having a conversation about sex for the purpose of understanding each other's sexual character. We need to tell each other honestly and tenderly what we need, what we feel, what we want sexually, what we'd like to try and what we're not sure of. And we do this without shame or fear or guilt because God himself wants us to have satisfying sex because he created us as sexual beings with this capacity. Great sex for life is possible if we follow God's plan for sex within the secure framework of an exclusive lifetime commitment of marriage. As a matter of fact, great sex for life is only possible within marriage because it is only within marriage that sex is blessed by God, its creator. Finally, I'd like to add that within marriage, all of the mysteries about our own sexuality can be expressed 
and satisfied and made acceptable to ourselves and to our partner and the God who loves us, even when we are completely naked before our partner and before God. Okay, so that's uh, the lesson on great sex for life and the completion of our series, um, uh, Marriage Prep uh, 101. I want to thank all those who participated here in the class. I want to thank those who are uh, watching online. You know those who are watching online, you can download the uh, student notes and download this lesson if you wish and use it to teach other people. Uh, absolutely free. We're happy for you to use all of our materials in that way. Okay, that's it for now. God bless you all.